Hi, everybody. Some remarks for you today on the book The Immense Journey by Lauren Isley. Uh, Lauren Isley is a unique figure in our course. He is a nature writer in a certain way, um, as I expect, especially the slit and some of the, uh, the piece on water, the earlier pieces, uh, make very clear. Also, however, he is an anthropologist and a natural scientist, so he's really bridging the gap between nature writing and science writing in a way no other author in our course will do. Let's take a look at Lauren Isley. Here he is, and here is the cover of his book, uh, The Immense Journey, the subtitle of which is An Imaginative Naturalist Explores the Mysteries of Man and Nature. We can take this opportunity right off the bat to emphasize that this book, first written in 1946, published in 1957 again, um, uses the term man in a non-gender specific way. This was very characteristic of the period right up through the end of the 1960s. Um, so certainly when he's referring to man, He's referring to all human beings, but let's dive in. As mentioned, Lauren Isley was a professor of anthropology. He was born in 1907 and died in 1977. Um, but in addition, he was a popular science writer. Uh, this book is, we have is his, his best known. We'll say more about it in a moment. Um, Isley is known for his poetic prose and for expressing wonder and reverence. For nature, the, the tone of his writing, and you'll see this reading it, he has such an attention to detail and such a, a keen eye for descriptions uh, and for reaching through those descriptions to a kind of deeper meaning, some kind of encounter between himself and what he is describing. He's been compared to Thoreau uh, for his keen eye for the details I have on the slide here, the details of animal and plant life, but also for his challenge to modern ideas of progress and technology. You see this in The Bird and the Machine, one of the chapters assigned from the book today. Um, he's skeptical of people looking into the future and uh, re relying on technology. He's interested in life, as he puts it, and as we will see. Um, Isley himself was famously really awkward in person. He was a naturalist. He liked being outside. After delivering a lecture, he would just run off the podium without taking questions. Um, often, also, he was not understood by his colleagues. Remember, he was a professor of anthropology. He was not a professor of literature or uh, simply a writer by practice. Um, his books, you might expect, to have been far more technical than they were. Um, you see some of that in the middle chapters of this book where he's engaging in debates in evolutionary biology and anthropology with uh, other professionals uh, to some degree. Um, but for the most part, his uh, desire to express things so poetically and in such a literary way um, failed to always convince his uh, professional academic colleagues. And we can think that's maybe the worst for them. As mentioned, The Immense Journey was first published in 1946. It was reissued in 1947 um, after the discovery that this so-called Piltdown Man um, was a hoax. And that's referred to in the title of one of the chapters. I'm going to say a bit about it a little later on. This, as I mentioned, also was his first book. Um, this would be his best known book and kind of launches his career. Um, in it, Isley, I have on the slide here, treats writing about nature as a form of contemplation and invites the reader to experience the scenes with him. Now, that's not substantially different than Thoreau or Muir or Leopold, as we've already seen in the course. But I think the kind of contemplation that Isley is concerned with here, of almost looking through the natural world to grasp, as he talks about, a kind of pattern uh, beyond it, uh, we have the notion of revelation that comes up here, um, is almost more akin to Ralph Waldo Emerson, a kind of background figure in our course. Remember, he was an associate of Thoreau, an older contemporary who supported Thoreau. He popped up with Muir out in California at one point randomly. Um, Emerson, remember, was a nature writer who saw nature as a kind of window into almost a human mind. Um, and some of the things that Isley says here about culture are reminiscent of that in, in my view. 
Um, as in other works, he blends themes from philosophy, theology, and history of science. His range of reference is really wide here. He'll talk about Francis Bacon and Thomas Hobbes and controversies between Darwin and Wallace, as we'll mention in a moment. Um, in all of these ways, he's not only describing nature, but he's integrating his observations of nature into his um, culture and into the culture he shares to some degree, presumably with the reader. And we have two um, quotations that he chooses as the epi epigraphs of the book. An epitaph is a quote that you put on your gravestone. An epigraph uh, is a quotation that you put at the beginning of a book to kind of set the tone for that book. So it's instructive to consider these two. I'll remark on them just briefly. We can talk about them more in class, and also I invite you to think about them first. Uh, from Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, man cannot afford to be a naturalist, to look at nature directly, but only with the side of his eye. He must look through and beyond her, her here being nature, uh, which he chooses to capitalize. We can look at nature only with the side of his eye. There's something here uh, that indicates Isley's method of proceeding in this book. Uh, he's not simply describing things in a very objective, straightforward way. That would almost be to obscure from himself the deeper meaning of these things, the kind of encounter that he believes to be possible and experiences through his, his engagements with the natural world. We'll, we'll see some examples of that as we move through. Uh, our second is from William Temple, who was uh, around the um, 1930s and 40s, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the, the kind of um, symbolic head of the Anglican Church. Um, William Temple writes, unless all existence is a medium of revelation, no particular revelation is possible. Now, the term particular revelation, this is an English class, not a religion class, but the term particular revelation pertains to things like the Bible or the Quran or the Torah, right? Texts, statements that have been received as a particular revelation from God. Right? So what Temple is saying here, Temple, who is an Anglican bishop, um, he's saying that unless all existence is, is a medium of revelation, those particular revelations cannot just stand on their own. They are a moment in this more general revelatory character of all of nature. Um, it's valuable to note here that Isley, at least to my knowledge, was not a you know very uh, practicing Christian. He's not writing this book in any way, again, to my knowledge, as a Christian. Um, he has lots of references to patterns or to reaching through nature, but I take him to be doing so much more in the manner of a transcendentalist, like Emerson, as mentioned, um, than as a, a Christian writing about nature. All right, so what I want to do is just move through each of the of the chapters. I'm going to call them chapters. They're kind of essays. To some extent, they, they stand alone, although the three in the middle about the Piltdown hoax uh, form a bit of a, a unit. The book begins with Isley on horseback. He is riding uh, in the desert countryside, and he comes to a slit in the, stand, in the sandstone. And this is his notion of the, the title of the chapter, The Slit. Um, there he finds a skull. He, if you want, contemplates this. He writes on this. I think it's a beautiful description. I hope you agree. Um, and he also reflects on time. Um, the slit for him becomes an image for his viewing of that little slit of nature, that little bit of time to which he has access and which he will describe. A couple of passages from this. Forward and backward I have gone, but for, and for me it has been an immense journey. Uh, this is a man who can find a skull in this kind of cavern within the sandstone and through contemplating that skull, uh, transport himself, as it were, back to the Pleistocene era. That says do not disturb. Back to the Pleistocene era, right? He, he's cutting across time. He's playing with time in a way. Nature is for him a window onto these abysses, these vast stretches of time. Uh, and there's such wonder in his portrayal of that. Later on, he writes, I can at best report only from my own wilderness. The important thing is that each man possess such a wilderness and that he consider what marvels are to be observed there. From his own wilderness. This is a notion of wilderness 
uh, that we haven't yet seen in the Course, that within each of us there is a wilderness. It's a very personal or a private thing, right? It's something, uh, 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 an aspect of ourselves that enables us to engage with the natural world in the way Isley is doing in this book, um, something for us to consider and talk about in class. The flow of the river. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, chapters in the book. I, I hope you might agree. He describes a time that he's swimming in the Platte River, um, and especially at the beginning of the chapter, and he, he talks about merging with the water. We'll look at a couple passages briefly here, um, and it also includes this episode with the catfish. Um, he takes this catfish home that is frozen uh, in this block of ice, uh, but the catfish, uh, in a theme that runs throughout the book, is just full of life. Right? And the catfish bursts to life, and they have a little encounter, and he finds that the catfish has actually leapt out of the bucket. Uh, and, and why? Uh, one thinks it's not suicide. <laughs> it's, it's the catfish wishing to, to go back to the river. Um, and so, in a way, we can see here uh, uh, that Isley is a bit of the product of his time. I mean, there's something tragic about the catfish dying um, that we would maybe be more sensitive to today. Um, but that urge for life is what he chooses to focus on. He writes, I was water and the unspeakable alchemies that gestate and take shape in water. Uh, he, he plays with, he has a quotation from Thoreau about the fish in Walden Pond being kind of congealed bits of water, ourselves being three quarters water, right? So well, the image of ourselves as water, ourselves as part of this natural world, uh, really shines through in this chapter. There is no logical reason, he writes, this is a passage often quoted from the book, this is no logical reason for the existence, there is no logical reason for the existence of a snowflake any more than there is for evolution. It is an apparition, the snowflake, from that mysterious shadow world beyond nature, that final world which contains if anything contains the explanation of men and uh, that final world which contains, if anything contains, the explanation of men and catfish and green leaves. Uh, all themes from the chapter. What can explain these things, men and catfish and green leaves? Um, well, I mean, if, if you want to be you know, religious about it, you can, you can say God. Um, he doesn't say God. Uh, you notice that he doesn't, doesn't use the language of God really anywhere in this book. He's talking about a pattern. He's talking about a community of life. He's talking about a web, an interrelated network of life, right? Um, and that this network is somehow expressive of a kind of underlying order in the world, um, all of things uh, that we can, each of us, consider. I want to introduce now the three middle chapters, which sit kind of oddly within the book. Um, they form a kind of unit. Um, the book was republished in 1957. In 1953, it was realized that, and here we have an image of it, the so-called Piltdown Man, um, named for the place where this fragment of a skull was found, uh, it was realized that this, in fact, was a hoax. Uh, when this was reportedly discovered in 1912, it had been you know, produced as a hoax, uh, and it, it, its aim was to uh, be the missing link between earlier forms of hominid life and ourselves as human beings. This searching for the missing link uh, was something that much preoccupied people in the decades after Darwin wrote and this Piltdown Man was thought to be it. Well, it wasn't yet. Um, we have some images here associated with it, a painting uh, representing some of the scientific uh, scientists who were studying it at this time. Uh, we have here uh, the first of the three chapters concerned with this from I, uh, Isley. The first is called The Real Secret of Piltdown. He begins with a question. Where did man get his brain? Okay, short story. Uh, the human brain is significantly more developed than we, as human beings, would even need for day-to-day -day activities. Um, far more than other uh, uh, forms of animal life as well. Now, we ourselves, of course, are animal life, right? So why is it that our brain is as it is? Remember, Isley is an anthropologist, and anthropologists are very concerned in this period with trying to trace 
where human beings evolved from. I mean, Isley is accepting the theory of evolution here, so this is not a creation versus evolution thing. Uh, but he traces a debate between Darwin and Wallace, Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, about the evolution of the human brain, and I put here the capacity for intellectual, the, the ability um, for us to have a mind in a way, and to engage in all of the linguistic and cognitive pursuits that Isley is engaging in in this book. Um, his view uh, from um, uh, Wallace, uh, Isley agrees with Wallace's view, um, that in fact uh, the human brain um, developed in a kind of explosive burst that there wasn't simply a long process of random mutation, but that something happened at some point. Um, and we see this in things like the Cambrian explosion, a period of enormously creative uh, evolutionary progress from our point of view and development. Um, and uh, Wallace and Darwin divided very sharply on this, um, but Isley accepts Wallace's claim stated as this, man had transferred to his machines and tools many of the alterations of parts that in animals take place through evolution of the body. So it was through the use of tools, uh, tools as an extension of the brain in a way. And we see this with phones and computers and tablets today, these tools that, that we use to extend our abilities so far beyond what we could do on our own. There's a passage that's significant on this score, and I'm just going to do this a couple times, these longer passages, but let me just read this out and draw your attention to it. I invite you to think about it. Uh, we are now in a position, Isley writes, to see the wonder and terror of the human predicament. Compare this with Thoreau as well. Man is totally dependent on society. Creature of dream, he has created an invisible world of ideas, beliefs, habits, and customs, which buttress him about and replace for him the precise instincts of what Isley calls here the lower creatures. In this invisible universe, he takes refuge. But just as instinct may fail an animal under some shift of environmental conditions, so man's cultural beliefs may prove inadequate to meet a new situation, or on an individual level, the confused mind may substitute by some terrible alchemy, cruelty for love. So Isley is here identifying human, we can call culture, right, society, uh, with, uh, or sorry, as an extension of ourselves as human beings, that just as our physical bodies have undergone a process of evolution, so too does and must our culture. And if a culture fails to adapt and fails to develop, uh, that culture also will prove to be maladaptive in uh, the Darwinian sense and, and cease to, cease to uh, advance. Uh, obviously, there are many uh, things to discuss uh, under this heading, but this is the view uh, I wanted to draw your attention to from Isley. In the second of these three central chapters, um, we have a discussion of the Oreopithecus, uh, these are fossils uh, from the animal depicted here. Um, they're 10 million years older than the earliest known fossil men. Um, so he describes in the chapter, and you will see when this, this fossil is uh, brought over to, to New York from a scientist in Switzerland, and new attention is drawn to it, and there's this um, uh, debate that occurs among evolutionary biologists. Again, all rather technical with respect to our course, but you can give it a skim uh, to your benefit. Um, he concludes in this chapter, and, and what I hope you could take away from it, at least as an understanding of his claim, we have to admit that many lines of seeming relatives, rather than merely one, lead to man. It is as though we stood at the heart of a maze and no longer remembered how we had come here. Um, in a way, I said at the top that Isley is kind of challenging the uh, uh, notion of progress, right? There's this one solid line of progress simply leading to us. Um, with this image of the maze, he's drawing attention to just how complex and how, in a way, accidental and how hard to predict uh, and measure our evolutionary past is. It's not simply a charge directly to ourselves. Um, and I, th I take that to be one of the uh, really valuable contributions of, of his work. 
In this third one, uh, The Man of the Future, this is maybe the, the strangest of the three chapters. I mean, he's talking about um, fossilized human remains uh, and remains of other species related to us uh, found in Africa and, and other parts of the world. Um, if you went to the Yale, um, what was it called, the Peabody Museum, at Yale uh, or other museums of natural history, very often they would feature um, um, skulls or uh, you know fossil remains of earlier species uh, and of uh, of early um, uh, versions of, of the human species. Um, I, I take the the yield of this chapter to be the following. Um, it depends on the discovery of what we see here in the image, the so-called Boscop skull. Um, this is a fragment of a human skull that gives evidence of a much larger brain uh, than any other future uh, version of the species species would exhibit. Uh, what is the what is the takeaway here? Um, Isley points out that we often think what we need is more brain capacity. If we just had a bigger brain, if we had more intelligence, right? We could do more computations. We could have more abstract thinking. Okay, if we had that then we'd be okay. Uh, and what Isley is saying uh, is that's not the case. We've, we've had that, right? Uh, the solution is not more cognitive capacity. The solution is something different, a passage from this chapter. The need is not really for more brains. The need is now for a gentler, a more tolerant people than those who won for us against the ice, the tiger, and the bear. The hand that hefted the axe out of some old blind allegiance to the past fondles the machine gun as lovingly. It is a habit man will have to break to survive, but the roots go very deep. So here we have a mixing again of biological evolution and cultural evolution, right? The problem is that we have not culturally evolved beyond violence. We have not evolved beyond cruelty um, or you know, fondling the machine gun. The, these desires, these, these urges to dominate right, others um, are written into our culture uh, and, and need to be broken if we are to survive. Um, he, there's a passage about love that I want to get to momentarily. Uh, the next, uh, <laughs> this is a funny one. Do you like this image? I thought this was kind of fun. Little men and flying saucers. I mean, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there was a lot of talk about flying saucers, so the Area 51 and this kind of thing. Uh, and what Isley is interested in here is not really uh, saying a final word, although he does reach a conclusion in his, in, to his, in his opinion about extraterrestrial life. Um, he's interested in why we find it so fascinating. And why do we insist on imagining, as in the little doll in the image here, why do we insist on imagining that extraterrestrial life will be basically like ourselves? Um, he walks through some history of what he calls geological prophecy. Uh, the, these are developments over the last two, three hundred years where people have looked at you know the development of after Darwin different species or even just human development uh, and have uh, thought that there was some you know deep meaning in this that that the world in the end was as he puts it here man-centered right that, that the universe is directed toward human beings as its highest kind of accomplishment and, and therefore other species will probably look like human beings well what does Isaac say we are so bound up we human beings, with every other form of life on this planet. There's such a network, such a pattern, as we referred to earlier, that to think that that network or pattern was reproduced exactly, uh, or even in a way approximating it on other planets, is not realistic. Um, let's look at a couple of the passages here. The flying saucer and the much publicized little men from space equate neatly with our own projected dreams. When we talk about extraterrestrial life in this way, the most interesting thing we can learn about it is not something about extraterrestrial life, but rather about ourselves and the fantasies that we project onto life. The truth is that man is a solitary and peculiar development. Uh, and it is, in my own words, a human fantasy to imagine that extraterrestrial life will look like us. There's another passage I'd like to, to read for you here. This is from near the end of that chapter of Little Men and Flying Saucers. 
in a universe whose size is beyond human imagining, where our world floats like a dust moat in the void of night, men have grown inconceivably lonely. We scan the time scale and the mechanisms of life for itself for portents and signs of the invisible. As the only thinking mammals on the planet, perhaps the only thinking animals in the entire sidereal universe, that is, the universe composed of stars. The burden of consciousness has grown heavy upon us. We watch the stars, but the signs are uncertain. We uncover the bones of the past and seek for our origins. There is a path there, but it appears to wander. The vagaries of the road may have a meaning, however. It is thus that we tor uh, it is thus we torture ourselves, right? So what are we torturing ourselves with? We're looking for meaning. We're looking for a sense, oh, you know, we're, we're part of a, a cosmic community of life forms like ourselves, right? We're looking back at our origins. We're looking up to the stars. We're lonely. We're inconceivably lonely, right? Uh, and, and this is what uh, Isley is, is giving expression to, this torture that we subject ourselves to. Just a couple more um, chapters I want to comment on here. Um, the first is called The Judgment of the Birds. Uh, and, and this one, I think, is an especially beautiful one. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a, a hodgepodge of, of different encounters that Isley has with different animals, um, including a, um, a group of birds from a New York hotel, uh, a crow, a, a raven and sparrows. And I want to highlight that one for us, as well as a spider weaving, weaving her web. Um, in all of these cases, he, he believes that this is, uh, well, let me read the passage, I'll comment on it. The world I have come to believe is a very queer place. Queer meaning strange. But we have been part of this queerness for so long that we tend to take it for granted. One must seek what only the solitary approach can give, a natural revelation. A natural revelation. So he's not here, again, talking about God. He's talking about a revelation of this pattern of a kind of underlying network of connections among various forms of life. Um, and he thinks that we can glimpse this through our encounters with particular uh, moments in nature, animals and plants and so forth. I want to uh, read for us our last longish passage here. Um, it's a very beautiful passage. And make sure not to miss this one. Uh, he's talking about um, a, a raven. Uh, who has been threatening uh, a group of smaller birds. I believe that they are, um, I believe that they are sparrows. Yes, the song sparrow. Uh, and these birds uh, assert themselves in kind of an image of life against death, represented by the raven. So here we have the following. It was then I saw the judgment. This is the judgment of the birds. It was the judgment of life against death. I will never see it again so forcefully presented. I will never hear it again in notes so tragically prolonged. For in the midst of protest, they forgot the violence. There, in that clearing, the crystal note of a song sparrow lifted hesitantly in the hush. And finally, after painful fluttering, another took the song, and then another, the song passing from one bird to another, doubtfully at first, as though some evil thing were being slowly forgotten. Till suddenly they took heart and sang from many throats joyously together as birds are known to sing. They sang because life is sweet and sunlight beautiful. They sang under the brooding shadow of the raven. In simple truth, they had forgotten the raven. They were, uh, for they were, the singers of life and not of death. This moment for Isley, as he says, I will never hear it again, I will never see it again, this was a moment of what he calls natural revelation. Uh, and this brings into a different register uh, what we've seen in some of our, our other authors earlier mentioned. Uh, the penultimate chapter here, this is the second to last, is called The Bird and the Machine. Uh, here he's talking about, in effect, Robots, uh, machines, which are getting smarter, which might eventually reproduce themselves, right? Uh, he says, uh, quote, there's a magazine article on my desk that reads, machines are getting smarter every day. I don't deny it, but I'll stick with the birds. It's life I believe in, not 
machines. There's something very 1950s about this, the assertion of life against this kind of mechanized culture, this extension of gizmos and gadgets and newfangled things. Uh, there's a beautiful passage in here about a sparrow hawk, and uh, we can raise questions about why he was capturing this animal in the first place. Um, he is aware of the violence of his action. He calls himself an assassin about five times, uh, capturing the sparrow hawk for the zoo. Uh, but he does choose, spoiler, he does choose to release the hawk. And I uh, would like to read for you, the passage is too long. It's about one page uh, where he uh, describes the time uh, describes the, the, the reuniting of the hawk with its mate um, in the air. And the language used in that passage is, is some of the best known in this book, certainly some of the language I find most moving. I direct your attention to that. Our last um, chapter is The Secret of Life. And here he considers a number of questions. By the way, this is in the meaning of life, like what is the meaning of life? You know, uh, it, it is a question of where did life come from? Uh, or as I put it here, where did life begin? When did life begin and how and where? Uh, he considers the funny possibility that life on this planet might have come from another planet, which as when he could put it, but doesn't kind of kicks the can down the road. It doesn't really tell us any new information, right? As to answering the question, it just kind of locates the origin of life elsewhere. Um, but uh, the, the ultimate question for him um, is not... Uh, precisely where it came from, we can't really know. Uh, but the question of um, how it arose and, and what relation matter has to life. I mean, obviously, matter is living or matter is dead. Uh, but let's read the passage and I'll comment on it. If dead matter has reared up this curious landscape of fiddling crickets, song sparrows, and wandering men, it must be plain even to the most devoted materialist that the matter of which he speaks contains amazing, if not dreadful, powers, and may not impossibly be, as Hardy has suggested, but one mask of many worn by the great face behind. Now, Thomas Hardy, whom he's quoting there, uh, would have been talking about God in some kind of broad cultural sense. Uh, I don't know that Thomas Hardy was an especially religious Christian. Um, however, we have here a notion of matter of nature as containing within itself something that extends beyond itself, this, this pattern, this network, I say again and for the last time. Um, this um, notion of, of depths, of natural revelation, and of something, um, what was the term I was going to say, of natural revelation, uh, and, and it escapes me, friends, but this is the depth dimension that Isley is introducing into our course um, in which we're considering, um, uh, I'll go back to the full camera here. This is the depth dimension that he's introducing to our course where we're looking at this notion of nature, of wildness, and of civilization. And here we have wildness. Um, I was going to refer earlier to the wilderness within himself back in the very first chapter there, the slit. Uh, each of us has within ourselves a certain wilderness, a certain untamed quality um, through which we can relate to others. Only if we abide in that wilderness can we hope to recognize these patterns that Isley sees um, beyond the nature he describes. See what you think of it, friends. I look forward to our discussion.